my name is Peter Wu. I'm going to be your moderator, and, uh, and I'm going to be speaking third about my project. Um, but uh, we're going to be focused pretty heavily on the hardware side today, but we're also going to be talking about software integration from, from one of our speakers at the end. Um, there's a wide variety of projects that we're, uh, there we're showing today, from low-cost, compact, low-resource to high-cost, full-size, high-resource. <laughs> um, and so we're going we're gonna to see all those things. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Philippe Bessa. Uh, Philippe comes to us from Brazil, and he's done a really fascinating uh, Piper Seneca project with a lot of home fabrication. And he's going to start off by telling us about that. So welcome, Philippe. Cool. Thank you. Good day, everybody. Um, I'm glad you all are here um, and uh, be seeing our presentation. Hope I can cope with all your expectations. So feel free to ask questions at the end of the session. So um, this is what I plan to cover today. So a little bit about me, a little bit of the prototypes that I came uh, throughout the, uh, the years, and uh, simulator components, the panel and the instruments uh, set up force feedback yoke, the electrical trim, the GPS stack that I have, and finally, the simulator panel structure with the undercarriage and uh, the fuselage itself. So um, that's me, flying a, a Piper Cherokee. So um, I'm Felipe Bessa, flying all the way from the southwest of, uh, of Brazil, a city called Cascavel. Um, I'm a computer engineer, and uh, I did the PPL in South Africa when I was living uh, in Cape Town. Then I moved back to Brazil and continued with uh, the CPL license. So I'm halfway through. This I was doing one of the uh, long haul um, type of uh, uh, navigations there. Then back in 2012, 11, I decided to start building the, the, the simulator. Uh, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just wanted to build like a simulator. And uh, it's all times that I like to, to, to fly uh, FSX back to the 98, you know, 2000, 2004. Um, and then I decided to do um, uh, the sim. So here's the very first prototype. So I got that at... Uh, I remember these, uh, uh, these pack of uh, Black Label beer. I bought that. We had a braai at home, and I, bought, I drank all the bottles there. <laughs> and uh, that's what I thought. OK, why not use these to be my first prototype? So that's why I got all those round circles and switches, because I, uh, I did buy them uh, on the internet, like all the way from the UK and stuff. But I, I've never seen that working on the simulator. So um, I eventually got that hooked up to, the, um, to a little card, and it was so nice to see turning the encoder and see the HSI uh, moving there. So I, I said, OK, I have to go with that, and uh, I want to be like a proper simulator. But at that time, I just wanted to have a Cessna 172. That's what you see on the, on the screen. But you know that we never are happy with what we have. We always want to go bigger and bigger. So that's my second prototype, where I went to the, I lived in this, uh, this apartment, and uh, I walked out of the, of the door and saw this uh, picture frame on the garbage, and I say, why not use this for the second prototype, right? So I got the same encoders, the same switches, but I got new, uh, um, new switches, which is the overhead uh, um, uh, switches there. So that's when I decided to go to uh, a twin engine uh, type of simulator. But I didn't know which one to use. I was still testing with, uh, um, with the Baron, but then eventually I ended up doing the, uh, uh, the Seneca. Um, why Seneca? It, Seneca is largely used in Brazil, especially the Seneca's ones and two. Uh, with uh, the flight schools there. It's, uh, uh, as I heard, is a, uh, um, a good plan for, for maintenance and uh, for flight schools there. It's, it's a strong one. And also because Embraer in Brazil, back in time, they were uh, uh, in partnership with uh, Piper Aircraft, building them uh, in the national soil, right? 
And, um, and I said, why not? So if in future this sim should go to a, a place that is not a, at my home, uh, it could be used for training, possibly, right? So that's when I, when I decided going with, uh, with the Seneca. So here is my first sketch. I did that on, on Photoshop, uh, but then I moved to Coral. I, I didn't know how to use Coral. So everything that, uh, 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 all the tools I learned on the way. So um, I got that on Photoshop and it was horrible. Then I moved to Coral. I did some sketches and stuff, but then I got it plotted with a real size and put to a uh, styrofoam. So that way I could see the size of the cockpit and how it would be uh, uh, if I had that uh, cutting laser and stuff. So that's the, the, the very first one. And, um, and I said, no, this is the plane I want to go. But I got other problems there because there wasn't any gauge available on the, net, on the, on the internet like for Seneca 5. So I ended up finding the Sim Innovations Air Manager, and that's when I started building and coding uh, the, the gauges. So I started with all the engine cluster side, and then I moved to, um, uh, to the rest of, of the panel. So it's all my codes, and the graphicals are all uh, uh, made by myself. And uh, Air Manager now, it's got extensively extensively used on, on my scene, controlling the, the various hardwares and, uh, and lights and switches and stuff there. So I also got, uh, apart from, the, from the, um, the, the gauges, I get the engine instrument, which is a digital uh, readings of the, of the engineers and um, also fuel quantity, um, voltages, um, and all set of um, uh, configurations that you can fly with the plane. So I got that also customized. Um, the clock, uh, I also got that customized to, to my project, plus the annunciators, which uh, was also made from scratch. Um, uh, to, uh, to show all the, 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 the failures and lights that is uh, needed on the, on the, on the cockpit. Uh, my configuration, I've got three raspberries there, uh, what, two for the pilot side, so it's a 24-inch LCD plus a 10.1, which is the, the right bottom corner there. Um, you'll see the vacuum and uh, uh, temperature uh, gauges, plus another one to the pilot side. I also use those raspberries there to control certain uh, functions on the system, especially uh, uh, on the pilot side. So all the, the, the clock, the DME uh, um, gauge, and the engine instrument is driven by uh, raspberry through Air Manager. The other one, which drives the, the, the lower side uh, um, uh, LCD, drives all the lights for the, um, for the sim. And the co-pilot runs the encoders there uh, for the co-pilot side. So this is a, just a quick video that you can see Arduino uh, used um, to control encoders. At this uh, video, I, don't, I didn't have the accelerator there, but you, you can have the accelerator to, uh, to speed up your turn. It, it's pretty straightforward to, to do that and very precise. I was really unhappy with the, uh, uh, with the other card I had. I was missing a lot of pulses there and no, no precision at all, right? And um, I liked uh, the way uh, doing that. And I can play that. Uh, the same instrument works for flight simulator and prepare plus uh, explain. So it's just uh, uh, the, the same one. And here also the clock. So I uh, got that. Uh, Customize so the clock. There is no uh, action on the scene because I don't need that. It's purely the instrument, so the the chronometer and uh, local time, uh, Zulu time, and, and and the rest of the functions there. Here is the engine instrument. Um, oops, sorry. I've got like a six-position uh, switch. And I can show the various informations from the um, 
from the engine, like uh, RPM, uh, TIT. Um, this part is uh, configurations that you can run your uh, flight. So if you are on a cruise speed there, you can set the airplane to 60% uh, power. So you know what is 60% in terms of uh, what readings you need to have on a TIT, RPM, and, and the rest of, the, of that. It also shows the, the fuel quantity, outside and inside temperature, uh, all the electrical components, uh, battery, and uh, the vacuum. So it's a, 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 it's a very good instrument there to complement uh, the, the analogic gauges. Bezels. The bezels are self-made, uh, uh, acrylic made. Um, back in time, it was about two years ago. Uh, 3D printing wasn't uh, that easy to get back in Brazil. Very expensive. Uh, a bezel like that would cost me at least like $15 each. And I have like 34 on my sim, so it would be like a, a fortune there. And I decided going with acrylic. So as you know, acrylic with a laser cut is a 2D uh, layout, so I, I got like a flat file to uh, scratch the, the edges and make the slope. And with sandpaper, I could smooth the surface, and I use uh, polyester uh, mass, I think it's called like that, uh, to remove the joints of the three cuts of acrylic that I had. Uh, I sandpaper that again, very smooth, and then I black painted with spray. So it, as you can see, uh, the result of one of uh, the encoders type of uh, uh, bezel. I quite liked uh, the, the result. Uh, it was beyond my, my expectation, but it took me like two hours each bezel. So times 34, uh, you see how long I spent there uh, sandpaping these, uh, uh, these uh, bezels. The switches, I got these uh, Margerius uh, switch. It was the closest I could find uh, for, um, to look like the Senecas. But uh, the Senecas, of course, has the, all the background. It's uh, is taller, uh, but that's what I could get uh, close. And um, I got a, a label maker at Amazon, which prints uh, white on clear. It was really nice, and it, uh, it, it, it glues nicely and even if you keep switching the, uh, um, uh, flipping the switch, it won't come off on your, on your hand. So I, there are like, uh, I think out of 20, 24 uh, switches there. So it was really nice to have uh, those uh, label, it's a $10 label maker there, so it, it made all the work there. Down there is the uh, overhead, um, overhead switches, so all the engine uh, lights and uh, left and right engine uh, switches uh, is on the top of the, of the shell. I also made uh, the landing lights, so it's coated in Arduino. Uh, it's driven by that Raspberry, uh, sorry, uh, it's coated in Raspberry, uh, driven by uh, um, um, Ardu um, Air Manager. Fuel selector is uh, also driven by um, Arduino, made of acrylic, so engraved. I used a linear potentiometer. I'm not sure if you can see, like in the, in the middle there, there is a, uh, um, uh, a small magnet which attached to the lever of the, of the potentiometer. So when I move that, I, I hear the click of the off position there. So I know that it's on the off position. I customized the code because moving from on to crossfit, it was going through the off position. It, uh, if you do that on the plane, um, 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 a Carenado, it will shut down the, the you cut the, um, uh, the fuel there and it will shut down the engine. So I put like a timer there. So if it only shuts down, if uh, it stays in uh, three seconds in that position, on the off position. So I can move around easily there. And showing the switch for the landing light, it's a straightforward uh, uh, two LEDs uh, uh, board and controlled also uh, via air manager. The throttle quadrant is from uh, precision flight controls. I quite like the, uh, the layout of that. Uh, but I didn't want to use their console because it wouldn't fit on my, on my project. So I pretty much 
replicated the way they do that with the linear potentiometer. I tried with the springs, but it was too, uh, too strong to, uh, to move the, the lever when you uh, sat the, the power properly during flight. So I said, I need to get something lighter there. So I came up with this crazy idea of uh, using those elastic uh, wires there, and it moves. So I could uh, untighten the, the, um, uh, the lever, so it's very easy to move forward and back. So I can set the, the positions. I was afraid of, if I want to go from 75% uh, to 70% power set, uh, that I would overshoot or undershoot the, the, the positions there. I didn't like that. So. This is my last uh, uh, version, so and I'm really happy with that result. Then I got my vertical console. It's uh, it's made of uh, various cuts of wood, of wood uh, glued together, so I, I could make the internal spaces there. I used uh, what is called like wood mass to uh, sandpaper and make a, a single surface. I got that uh, painted with, it's, in Brazil it's called a liquid, liquid rubber, so if you, um, you can take it out, the, the paint, and, and, and strengthen that uh, like, uh, uh, like rubber. And got the air vent and cow flaps uh, levers uh, made of aluminium, connected to a, a 12 position switch, although I use only three of that plus the prop sync switch connected to uh, an LED to show you it's on off. Uh, also interfaced with uh, Raspberry controlling uh, them. And I use the same label maker to, to make the labels there. Annunciators also made of acrylic. Uh, I got the boards from uh, PC Flights. The label, I got the first one uh, using a, a simple label maker, but the second version of, of that was printed using a UV printer. Uh, so it's a, it's a white acrylic uh, at the bottom and then the print on the top. So I made the design of those, uh, of, of the labels and got that printed uh, on the sim. The force feedback yoke mechanism. Uh, as you know, I, I do the, the real flying and I never wanted, I was afraid that I would give up if flying with a simple yoke, feeling nothing there. So I decided, no, I, I must have a, a yoke. But uh, I also didn't want to go with the, the options out there. And I said, okay, I will do that myself. So I got the, the project from Ian. It's a BFF simulation uh, cards. Uh, he's based in the UK. He shared the project there, uh, all the, the design of the, uh, of the yoke made of wood, and I translated that to a metal frame. So uh, I put all on 3D. That's when I started also playing around uh, Fusion uh, 360. So another learning curve for me because I, I, I've never used uh, um, 3D uh, software before that. Motors came from, uh, from Italy. I did like all crazy ways to get them <laughs> in Brazil because as you may know, like customs in Brazil is very complicated and import them directly, it's also complicated. So very good friends out there uh, brought and flew it uh, to me and it got uh, uh, to my lab there. So it's made of uh, aluminum, 0 0.9, laser cut, machine bent. Uh, I send uh, the company, they do like professional um, um, uh, metal cuts there, and they also have a bent machine. So I gave them bent here with 45, 90 degrees, and they, they gave me exactly what I needed. So this is how it's assembled. Uh, the two motors. I have the, uh, these little, um, um, uh, I forgot how to say that, but uh, uh, just to, to make the 180 position there. Uh, it's a 155 travel length. Also, there was another thing that I was really concerned because I didn't want like a short uh, travel 
of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 1,200 or, or even I see out there like 800 uh, travel uh, size. It's pretty strong. It's really nice to uh, get all the, um, the, the sensation of uh, vibration, forces. It reproduces takeoff, landings, gear up, gear down, flap up, flap down, tax. Uh, full power, prop wash, it's everything there, it's, you can uh, customize that uh, to you. I've got a um, Seneca 5 yoke replica, uh, this guy from uh, Romania, also I made all these crazy ways to get that to Brazil, it flew to Dubai, Dubai, Brazil, UK, and eventually it got there, thanks to my friends in, uh, at the company, <laughs> so everybody that was flying around, I was trying to find someone to bring something for me. <laughs> Then, as you know, you like to, oh, sorry, uh, you're never satisfied to what you have. I got these trim wheels, and I said, why not having an electrical trim? So, again, with the real flying, I like to fly uh, an airplane with an electric trim, because sometimes you even have these levers on, on, the, on the ceiling of the airplane. It's, it's not nice. And I said, I will have a, an electrical trim myself. So it's a Seneca 2 1975 uh, trim. The, the wheel was adapted to use a, a, a belt. Uh, uh, I did a reduction gear to connect to the potentiometer. So I could get all the turns of the wheel uh, to the potentiometer. Also from uh, Ian BFF, and it does all the AP following electrical trim on the yoke plus the manual uh, uh, mode. So here's a, a quick video. I also used the original marker there to, uh, to show me the position. So it's a, a 10 turn uh, wheel there. So uh, it goes all the way forward and back. Here with the action on the, on the yoke, it's directly driven by the card, the, the BFF card which goes directly to the, to the motor there and action on, the, on that. The GPS stuck. Uh, I wanted the GTN 750 and I coded the CAP 140 and the GNC 255B. Here's the, how it looks the case. So it's 8.9 inch LCD, a self-made SLA 3D printed bezels. Uh, as I said, I've got these uh, GNC 255B uh, um, uh, Garmin Navcom plus the Bendix King uh, Autopilot. Then I've got the, a second structure, I forgot to bring that to, to show these guys, uh, printed in 3D. So the back case is, uh, uh, is now 3D printed because I will have two Arduinos inside, so I don't have that bunch of wires uh, getting out of the, of the case, so I will have only three, one for, for the Arduino Leonardo, Mega, plus the touch panel. The undercarriage. Um, I was very concerned of moving my sim around and the mobility of that. Uh, I lived in a three-bedroom apartment, and I knew that one day I would move out. So I needed like a proper solution to move my sim out without disassembling everything. I was tired of that already uh, because I had like a previous move and things got uh, broken uh, uh, in the meantime. So it's made of a metal structure, two sections, one for the main panel and one for the fuselage in the cabin, right? Uh, it's uh, 10 centimeters from the floor, so the uh, rudder paddles can fit there. Here's the, uh, the entire structure there, five wheels in each one, so I can easily move them around. The seats, <laughs> it's from a HB20 Hyundai car. I got that uh, redone with a, a beige cover. That's my little dog there, which followed me on every mission on every day. <laughs> so every morning I was taking him for a ride and I was talking to him, what is the mission of the day? Okay, we need to go to the woodwork. And then the, the day after, okay, the, the ladder guy. And the other day, okay, we need to go to the store and buy some uh, 
uh, not screws and stuff. So he was always with me there. So I took this picture uh, of him. Then the, the simulator structure, it's a laser cut, um, six and uh, three, um, six, nine and three mm um, uh, width there. I had to do that way because I didn't have access to a proper woodworker because I was living in Sao Paulo and it's, uh, everything is expensive there and it's far away. But now in the city that I'm living there, it's easy to do some of these woodwork. So I, at that time, I decided to do the laser cut so I could do that myself at home. So here's now the, the instructor, the back side, the front side. And also got the, the glare shield, uh, also laser cut. So I, I cut all of them at home. Uh, that's the laundry day, so I was cutting everything yeah. in the laundry. <laughs> uh, then I got the, the foam top, ladder, and uh, I got it uh, finally done. So here's another picture of the fuselage. And I got them uh, uh, designed in 3D as well, so I could confirm all the cuts, so I could make it just a once-off thing. So it's a cover it with a white wrap, it's the same kind of uh, 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 wrap that uh, they put on the cars, you know, so I could uh, get that done. That is a video, I don't know why it's not playing, uh, showing the, uh, the lights, internal lights, it's controlled by uh, uh, two dimmers, so you have an independent uh, pilot and compilot uh, lights uh, in there. Rudder pedals from... Uh, from McBarry cockpits in Brazil, and carpet throughout the same there. Here's the last picture I've got. So there's just a few to go, but it's uh, it's pretty much it's pretty much done. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank like my uh, my wife back home to have supported me, uh, my family friends around the world, and it's a very good uh, community. Everybody helps everybody, so uh, special thanks to all. Thank you. I got one minute after this. So. Yeah, you're awesome. Yeah, good, so. <laughs> all right, so um, next I'll be introducing Robert Prather. Um, Robert uh, comes from Houston um, and has done some really fascinating work converting uh, original equipment manufacturer airliner parts. Um, for me as a 737 builder, this is really the holy grail of what we do, to, to buy a part off of eBay, um, seemingly derelict, something that's um, you know, otherwise uh, just a beautiful paperweight and being able to take it and to turn it into something useful. Um, I've obviously been talking to Robert for a few months and planning this panel, but I met him for the first time yesterday, and if you haven't had a chance to go buy his Serial Boots Bites booth, it's right across the door here from the, um, the exit to the lecture hall. Um, really fascinating work, and I encourage you to go see him. And let me get his presentation. All right, so welcome, Robert. All right. <clears throat> All right. Just forward and back? Yeah, so let's see the one with the paint. Yeah, that goes okay, forward. Perfect. Yeah, right. You'll see your timer here. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you, Peter. So my flight simulator journey began in 1998. Uh, I saw a report on the internet from a gentleman by the name of Kevin Saker, who had built a 767 in his bedroom. It was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life, and little did I know that day my life would change forever. Uh, <laughs> He, that, there was this burn for me to do the same thing uh, in my bedroom. I obviously had no idea where to start. I spent a year planning this thing out, and I spent the next 20 years uh, trying to, to really get this thing right and to perfect it. Um, <clears throat> I, I was really, really smiling when um, at, at the pictures that were, were just shown because one of the pictures is very reminiscent of the first version of my simulator in 1999, which was made with wood and Radio Shack switches. Now, ironically, my rudder trim indicator was printed out on a piece of paper with a fluorescent bulb stuck behind. So needless to say, it didn't do anything, but I could sit there and I could use my imagination. So it was really imagination powered uh, simulator but it really fueled uh, that excitement that I got from the report. So very little here worked, but what did work was my electrical interface. Uh, it was a system that I called keyboard hacking. I developed a report which I published on flightsim.com 
in which I was able to take apart a PS2 keyboard wired directly to the pins on the keyboard and use that as a very crude and inexpensive interface for connecting physical things to the flight simulator. Um, and, and that really led the way for what, what now is, is serial bytes, which is powering real aircraft parts. But it started, it started here with these really crude Radio Shack switches. So a couple of versions later, a couple of hurricanes later, a couple of versions were destroyed, a couple of versions I threw away. Uh, we went from wooden plastic switches to laser cut, uh, CNC cut wood. Then we went from, from that to laser cut plastic, uh, laser cut acrylic with electroluminescent backlighting. Then we went from that to integrated backlighting. But that itch would just never stop. So fast forward about 20 years, um, this is kind of the, the before of the center pedestal, and, and this is the after. Uh, so I think that, that it's just finally starting to kind of subside. Uh, now I've, I've got about 90% of my, my cockpit is um, OEM aircraft parts uh, straight out of the aircraft. Now I'm building a Boeing 777, but obviously the, the parts are very difficult to find. So a lot of these parts are from the 757, the 747-400, and, and I've even been able to, because Boeing keeps their uh, designs largely the same, even some of the switches came out of 727s and older aircraft. I think I even have a couple of L-1011 switches in my cockpit. Uh, but you can see now, um, it, everything here is lit up. Uh, th this is kind of a full view. Uh, thanks to my beautiful wife who's here with me for uh, allowing me to do this. Uh, now. now <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, this now has about 150 degree field of view visual system. Um, so right now we're parked at uh, Intercontinental Airport, which I'm a native Houstonian, uh, born and raised. And uh, fully functional avionics. Uh, now, after I did the keyboard hacking interface, my next foray was to develop the synoptic displays. Uh, I was a Project Magenta user for a very long time, still am. Uh, but Project Magenta only did the PFD, the ND, and the ICAST. So I needed some way to do the synoptic displays. So I fired up BB6, uh, used all their draw calls, fired up FSUIPC. And so down there you can kind of see, uh, I believe that's the hydraulic display down beneath the throttles. And, uh, and then that's connecting back to the simulator. So that was kind of my, my second um, flight simulator uh, deal was the software design. Now you'll notice a couple of, of unique things here. Uh, the throttle quadrant, for instance, is obviously 767. Um, but so when I started my project in 1998, the flight, the uh, 777 had only been flying for two years. So finding parts for it was and remains very, very difficult. So I use parts that are very close. The 767 throttle quadrant was about as close as I could find to the Boeing 777. But for instance, the landing gear panel is OEM, the, the mode control panel, the flight management computer is one of the rare spines that, that uh, I've been able to find, uh, that's all OEM. So I mentioned that about 90% of my flight sim is real parts. So what about the other 10%? Some of that 10% is aftermarket parts from some fantastic panel makers in the community. But another part of that 10% are things that I created myself. One of the things that we're gonna talk about today is the instrument panel. So I was able to find a lot of components to the, the instrument panel, but not the instrument panel itself. I actually designed that from scratch. So what we're gonna to do today, we're gonna to talk about uh, very briefly three aspects of that. Uh, we're gonna talk about planning, we're gonna talk about design, and we're gonna talk about manufacturing. And after this, everybody in the audience will be able to make their own instrument panel. <laughs> so, Planning, first step. Uh, this is actually, I would say, measurably the most difficult and involved step. Plan, 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 plan. Uh, the most important part of this, I would say, start with the end game in mind. Once you've determined what aircraft you want to build, you need to really start planning out what hardware are you going to use? How much space do you have? Uh, my 777, uh, this is a sh uh, shot here, it, it is wall to wall in a 13 by 13 room and the screens are even folded in a little bit. It is spacious. So some people will do a half sim, some people will do um, a GA aircraft or um, a, a Pilatus PC-12 or a Lear 60 or something like that for space. The 777, the 747s, they take up a lot of space. So you need to think about how much space you have uh, available. What kind of material do you want to use? You know, the first version of my simulator was wood. Uh, and then of course, plastic. 
But, you know, I wanted something that was sturdier. And also, one of my design considerations was, how am I going to tie my glare shielding in? So I needed it to be designed from metal. So think about what material you want to use. But if you're using metal, how are you going to cut it? A lot of metals can't really be very easily cut with jigsaws, so that's a consideration. Um, what type of hardware will you use? What type of monitors will you use? Will you put monitors behind for the uh, uh, PFD and the ND and the ICAST? And if so, what size? You have to start thinking about all those things. Uh, are you going to send this to a machine shop? Are you going to cut it and fabricate it at home? Um, th these are all things that you want to just kind of plan out and just look through pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures and think, how would I design that or how can I find that? And the last piece, and this in 20 years is the question that I get absolutely more than anything. I want to build a 777. Where can I find the dimensions? Or can you just send me the Katia drawings? I get that request uh, quite a bit. It's, this is the hardest part. I mean, Boeing is obviously not handing out Katia drawings for, for the aircraft. So what did I do here? Um, it's not really a magic marker that I had for this. Um, the, the key here, the kind of secret sauce was um, cockpit posters and linear interpolation. If you have one part and you know one dimension, set up a really simple linear algebraic equation, x plus y, whatever, x over y, you, you, know, you know, pretty simple. And if you know one dimension and you have a cockpit poster, you can put a ruler to anything else on that poster and it will tell you the rough dimension. Now, it may not be millimeter for millimeter the same in the, in the aircraft, but because you're designing it, you can design everything around it. So even though this looks probably really, really close to the real aircraft, I'm pretty sure the geometry is off in different places, but you can't tell when you're in it. So first thing we're going to do, we're also going to identify what is our existing equipment. This is the equipment that I had for the instrument panel. I had the landing gear panel, um, I had the display bezels, and I had the clocks. That's all I had. Now we have to talk about what's missing. I didn't have the instrument, the instrument panel structure. I didn't have anything to mount the glare shield. My first glare shield design was horrible. It was three quarter inch MDF wood. It took two people to lift. It sagged under its own weight. It was just a very inefficient design. So in round two, I designed it such that the instrument panel would actually become a support for the glare shield. And I also designed it out of a, a thinner metal, which was lighter much, much thinner, version two was significantly better than version one. I didn't have the display select panels, I didn't have the, uh, I had the clocks, but I didn't have anything to mount them to. Uh, and, and also, don't forget, it's gotta, it's, something's gotta hold it up. So you have to design the stands for it as well. So those are, that's just a little fruit, food for thought in terms of planning. Plan, 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 think, think, think. The more time you spend in planning, the better the rest is gonna come out. So the next step is to design. I use a program, uh, I think you, you were using the same program, um, Fusion 360. Uh, a lot of people don't know, Autodesk Fusion 360 is free for educational use and also for startup businesses. So if you wanna do your own 3D designs, you can go out and you can download the software uh, right now. This is gonna allow you to model, uh, to draw out a piece of sheet metal, to cut holes through it, to do screws, to do threads, to do countersinks, uh, and also to do sheet metal folding, which is key. Because when you do your mounts, you're gonna to wanna to actually fold pieces of that metal so that you've got things to put screws into. The other big, big, big thing is you want to render your hardware. So once I identified what monitors I wanted to use, I just basically just drew a box. Go out to bestbuy.com or amazon.com or whatever, look at the overall dimensions of the monitor, and then draw it. Draw the, the, the largest dimensions and then draw the bezels and then put those behind your rendering. You'll be surprised, absolutely surprised what you find. And then of course, uh, all of your mounting points. Again, sheet metal folding is gonna be key for your mounting points. So these are the renderings. Um, th this stage took me about a year and a half. Uh, they're deceptively difficult because you get a couple of dimensions and then you, you look for monitors. You try a monitor, it doesn't work. I'm actually gonna jump forward and I'm gonna jump back. This was one of the early uh, renderings of, of my design. <clears throat> and you'll see a couple of things. Number one, you'll see that the monitor bezel is sticking out about half an inch on my standby instruments. That would look horrible if I, if I did that. But that was a monitor that I already had. 
and then I realized very quickly I was not going to be able to use it. So I went back to the drawing board. I said, well, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to get all three standby instruments using a single 15 inch monitor because that last instrument is just gonna look horrible, okay? Uh, and then also in the second picture, you can see that if I use that monitor, it's overlapping with the landing gear panel, it's overlapping with one of the, uh, the buttons. This design just would not work. But I was able to get this out the way in the design phase, so in manufacturing, it was all seamless. So let's go back. This is the clean design. Another thing I'll point out here, there are there's basically no tolerance here. Those monitors are touching. And then that second monitor is almost touching the landing gear panel. If I had not designed this in 3D, this, this would have been virtually impossible to, to figure out. But I also modeled my clocks so I could see how those would mount. I modeled enough of my landing gear panel to make sure that, that all of that would fit in. Uh, and you can see on, on my um, iCast, I have a little bit of the bezels uh, visible, but to me that was, that was okay. And it was fairly symmetri uh, symmetrical. But I had all three of my standby gauges without any bezel in the window. I had my PFD, my ND, my iCast for the captain and the um, uh, first officer, and I was happy with this design. Okay. So <clears throat> we've got our design, we've built our instrument panel, we've rotated around it, we've got our mounting points, we like the way it looks, we're ready to make this happen. So how are we gonna manufacture it? Um, I decided again because I was using metal, that I was not going to attempt to cut this myself. So I decided to go with a machine shop. And there were actually quite a few more machine shops near me than, than I, I, I even realized. So I decided to go with um, an aluminum alloy called uh, 5052 aluminum. Uh, this aluminum is softer and lighter and can actually be cut using a water jet CNC process. So essentially once I found a water jet shop, I sent them those, uh, those 3D renderings. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. I sent the shop the 3D renderings, and they were able to use, uh, for, for those of you who may know the water jet process, they use a very highly pressurized water with an abrasive, and that cuts through that metal like butter. But there are other ways to do this. You can do lasers. Uh, you've got some pretty powerful lasers out there. A lot of sim builders have CNC machines. If you have a fairly large cutting surface, then you could cut your instrument panel in, in sections. You can join them together. Um, you could use a jigsaw if you're gonna build this from, uh, from wood. I see a lot of sim builders do that. Build it from wood, cut it, um, sand it, paint it, prime it. It, it looks fantastic either way. Uh, but you wanna give some, some thought to that. Uh, the other thing here is, is painting. Um, invest in a, in a good paint gun. Uh, if you can find a part, maybe on eBay, you can take that to a, um, a Home Depot or a Lowe's or wherever you, your hardware store is. You can get them to paint match that, make a bucket of that paint, pour in the paint gun, and use that to, to spray your parts. So we looked at the design. Now I've gotten all the parts back from the, uh, the manufacturer. So the first picture that you see there is just testing the fit taking all of the raw parts and making sure that when I bolt them together, they're, they're going to fit. And in this part, you're having to do some sanding, you're having to do some cutting because it's not gonna be perfect when it comes, uh, when it comes to you. Um, putting screws, drilling screw holes, doing countersinks, all of that happens in this, this first phase. So this is the raw metal. These are all the parts that I got back from the, uh, the, the water jet shop. Um, secondly is doing this test fit with the physical hardware, putting the monitors in place, um, dropping in the landing gear panel, making sure that my drawings were accurate and correct. So at that phase, it was basically done. It just needed to be uh, uh, primed, painted, etc. So broke everything down. And the picture here, um, at first start with sanding um, because these processes leave a fairly rough surface. Take a good sanding paper, sand everything down. Um, clean it off very well with a microfiber cloth, shoot it with a primer, let that dry. Now one of my other secrets here is filler primer. Uh, filler primer will fill in a lot of those impurities, a lot of those dents, a lot of those imperfections. It give you a beautiful smooth surface. Shoot it with that filler primer, let it dry, sand it down, and then you're ready for the paint gun. And once you hit it with the paint gun, it should look like it just came out the Boeing factory. Uh, this is now the painted panel, 
with uh, the, the bezels that I was using for the standby instruments, the display units, and also putting the lower uh, instrument panel on, which I have not uh, painted yet, but you can start seeing it come together. And that's what it looks like. So with everything buttoned up back together, everything painted, uh, the electronics turned on, uh, it, 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 you know, that's when I could really sit back and, and do some imaginative uh, flying until I got my um, instrument, uh, my controls hooked up and, and whatnot. But this is kind of the culmination of everything that you just saw. So that was kind of the, it was a really high level overview. I wanted to leave it um, a, a, a little bit abstract, give you an opportunity to ask any questions when we get to the QA section. Uh, I'm gonna show you all one more thing here. Seats, I get a lot of questions about cockpit seats. They can be very expensive. Uh, these brown seats on eBay will usually go for between three and $4,000 a pair or more. What I did was I actually bought 737 seats that had the same backs as the 747. These are the IPECO J-Rail seats. Completely broke them down all the way back to the bare metal, sanded them down, cleaned 20, 30 years worth of gunk out them. You'd be absolutely amazed how dirty these things get. <laughs> um, again, got the beautiful uh, paint, paint gun, uh, sprayed them down, uh, ripped off the fabric from the armrest, took that to an upholsterer, and let them wrap it in the dark Boeing Brown put everything back together and they looked like they came straight out of a 747-400. And that cost me about $1,000 instead of $4,000. So, so these are just a couple of things to think about. I'm, I'm gonna kind of end on that note, but if you have any questions, I look forward to your questions in, during the Q&A and I really appreciate your time. That was awesome, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Well, thanks, Robert. That was fantastic. Um, so now I'm going to talk about my project. So as, my, as I said, my name is Peter Wu. I'm um, currently in the Washington, D.C. area, but I'm getting ready to move to, uh, to Florida. So this project I'm going to be uh, telling you about has actually now been completely disassembled and is ready to move. Um, I uh, bought this 737 nose section off of eBay in 2010, and it, and it took me about six years to turn it into this which is a full dual control fixed base flight simulator. Um, this is a uh, abbreviated version of a much longer talk that I usually give on this topic, and I'm gonna give you a QR code at the end so you can get the YouTube version of it that has a lot more detail. And um, as we've said, we're holding all the questions till the end of this session. We'll have about 15 or 20 minutes left, but then we're also gonna, when we conclude, um, go <coughs> across into the middle of the exhibit hall there where the bean bags are and um, give you all a chance to, to ask the individual builders um, additional questions that you might have. Um, so these, these were my original goals for my 737NG, um, to have real dual linked controls, to have realistic control loading, and to have an enclosed cockpit. And a question I get asked all the time is, why a 737? Why not a 75, which has a reputation for more sports car-like handling? Why not a big wide body, a 747, an A380? Why not an F-15? Why not an F-18? Well, the reason for that is it turns out that the 737 is probably the easiest airplane in the world for which to build a home simulator. I think when I'm done telling you this story, you're gonna say that there's nothing really easy about this, but compared to doing other airliners, it's much easier. And the reason is this is the most popular airliner that was ever built. The first one came off the assembly line in the late 60s. And in spite of the max debacle, this is still the most popular airliner that's ever been built. They've built more than 10,400 of these at this point. Um, enormous order book of these going forward. The good thing for any kind of airliner simulator builder, home or commercial, is that a lot of the early airframes have already been scrapped. And this is a classic model, what we call a, a steam gauge version of the 737. And there are many thousands of these that have already been completely broken down and scrapped. So parts availability is actually very good for this airframe. So I had my eBay uh, save search set up to, um, to search for Boeing 737. But if you do that, you're gonna get all the buttons and coffee mugs and all this other stuff that you wanna do. So I limited it to the aviation parts category. And I had spent a couple of years looking for this structure. I had some basic like 737 stuff. I had some real um, <coughs> Weber seats and you know, some other things. And I really wanted this 
circuit breaker module. Um, and I've been looking for it for a couple of years and I just couldn't find it. So, so many times in this endeavor, you have to buy a lot of something to get the one part you're after and then figure out how to you know, sell the rest of the lot to get most of your money back. Well, the only way I could get this module was to buy this. So this came up one day, you know, Boeing 737 cockpit scrapped. Um, it was, it had a buy it now price on it for eight thousand dollars. I tried 7,200, 7,500, 7,700, and you know, basically eight thousand dollars was what they would take for this. It was located in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, um, at the time. It cost me five thousand dollars to get it there. You, to get it to me in the Washington DC area. You can't go down to UPS and ask them to put this in a box. Um, it's, it's a big deal to, uh, to get it to you and it, it costs almost as much as the thing itself. How did it wind up in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas? Well, this is a picture of the actual airplane when it was flying, 332 Uniform Alpha. Um, it went brand new from the Boeing factory to United. They operated it for about 20 years and in 2008, and I still have the dispatch paperwork from this, they flew it part 91 from Chicago to Walnut Ridge and then they started to disassemble it. So this is what it looked like in the boneyard. This is an actual picture from their eBay ad, and then I've marked it up here with some of my instructions to them about how to cut it. They totally ignored that and just shipped the whole thing as one piece. Um, but you can see that they've removed the windows from it. Um, windows, uh, the front windows of an airliner are incredibly valuable items, and anything that had any sort of value from this cockpit that could be easily removed was removed before they, um, they sent it along to me. Um, so the long and short of that is it had been sitting out in the weather in Arkansas, which is in the Dust Bowl, for about two years. Um, so, you know, just, just weather and, and dust and everything had a chance to, to get in here before I got my hands on it. So this is the day that it arrived. I had anticipated this by going down to my local equipment um, uh, rental and renting this telescopic forklift, which I had never operated before, and they gave me the keys to it and said, good luck. And I said, could, could I just get a little tutorial before we go? Oh yeah, you know, you move the lever here. And so um, I really thought that I was just gonna pick this up with the forklift, which you see at the top of the picture, and just pick up this cockpit and slide it under the door of the hangar where I keep my small general aviation aircraft. It's got a little extra wing on it. And I thought, oh, no problem, I'll just put it in this extra wing and then I'll work on it there. Well, yeah, I mean, this is like way taller than the actual hangar. So I had this big problem where I had to like suddenly, and this was like, you can tell the sun's low, this is like six o'clock at night in the summer and now I've got to figure out where to hide this thing um, in my airport. And so luckily I had a friend who had a big box hanger, um, you know, big commercial hanger. And, and I said, could I put this in there for a couple of weeks? And it really turned out to be more like a couple of months. Um, because I had to, to cut it into small enough pieces to get back into my hangar. So this is how I started. This is another thing from the equipment rental, this um, you know, big die grinder wheel. It's about a 12, 14 inch wheel. It's a, it's a quarter inch thick and it's really good for removing big pieces of material. And I had no idea what was underneath the, the flight deck and what I would need to preserve and how the controls interlinked. I mean, like Robert was talking about the fact that you can't you know, like get dimensions out there. I mean, I could find very little information about this out there on the internet. Um, so I just started cutting holes and I, you know, I sort of gauged, you know, what I thought was a reasonable distance underneath the flight deck to start doing that. And I would, when I got in there, I, got, I found this incredible maze of wires and hoses and, and uh, tubing and um, cables and stuff running back and forth. And it was really hard to decide what, it was even hard to even see it, like what was going on. So I just took a die grinder and started sawing through, you know, cable bundles. Figured I probably wouldn't need those. And so here, you know, this is after a couple of weeks of this, you can see me looking through the nose gear well here. This is a inspection hatch into the nose gear well. And so it was about two months of nights and weekends in my friend's big box hangar till I got to the point where I could separate the nose gear well from the rest of the, the flight deck. Um, and so here's where I want to stop to say, if you ever embark on a project like this, to really have a very healthy respect for the tools. Um, these are high-speed tools. Um, they're potentially very dangerous. Um, you should always practice with a, a piece that you don't really care about. They require a firm hand. Um, I always, always wore safety goggles. Um, you, I'm doing a little bit of a no-no here. This is July, so you know, I've, I, I don't have you know, full skin covering, but you know, I, I was definitely hit by metal shards from this thing many times. Um, and one actually made it around the side of my safety goggles. It was just like it came in an oblique angle and it stuck in the sclera, the white part of my eye. 
Um, luckily, there was a doctor friend of mine who was in the next hangar over, and I was able to say, hey, could you come take this out? Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was lucky because it really hurt. So. Uh, but at any rate, um, I got to the point where I got the nose gear well off and a bunch of other you know, like aluminum parts, and I loaded this up, and I took it to my local scrap metal dealer. And um, I was able to recover about $1,000 of the cost of this um, cockpit just from selling scrap metal. And that was a combination of the scrap aluminum and also scrap copper, which was the, the hundreds of miles of wire which are inside just the front 13 feet of a Boeing 737. When I mean, you think about it, like every electrical component in the airplane has to come back to the circuit breaker panels that are in the back of the cockpit. So there's just, just enormous wire bundles that are in there that I didn't need. All right, so now I had the nose um, well separated and I was able to get my first good look at the bottom of the flight deck. Um, and this was actually fairly confusing when I first saw it because you can see it's still just packed with all this stuff. I mean, there's cable running everywhere and, and insulation and, you know, ducts and all this stuff that, you know, didn't really make sense. So, um, but unfortunately, I was just, I was in a hurry to get this thing out of my friend's hangar because I'd been there for two months. So I went back to the equipment yard. I rented the telescopic um, uh, forklift again and picked it up in the air and was able to put it down. Yeah, cool music. So... Um, and put it back down on this uh, farm trailer. I bought this off a of Craigslist, about uh, $1,000, $1,500 or something. You see, it's not in great shape. I mean, the wheels are kind of rusted and stuff, but you know, I was able to bring it on the, on the highway back to the hangar. But it was a really big trailer that was about 15 feet long, and so I was able to put the thing down on the trailer. So now I was able to actually walk into the cockpit for the first time. And remember, I had bought this whole thing thinking I just wanted the circuit breaker wall, and I was going to take that, and then I was going to sell the rest for parts, right? So this was kind of a love at first sight kind of moment. Um, I got in and there was this real beauty to the whole geometry of the cockpit, and especially the floor, which I don't have a picture of, but there's these enormous steel rivets on the floor. Boeing doesn't even bother to paint the floor because it would just get so scuffed up and the paint would just come off. So the floor is, is silver, so it's really cool looking. So at this point, I had to figure out how to, how to keep this whole thing. Well, I live in an area where real estate's really expensive. I had some engineer friends. They said, well, we'll so we'll, we'll take the center post off your garage and then we'll slide it under the garage door and then we'll close the door and then we'll figure out how to air condition the garage so you can keep it in there because you, don't want, you really don't want to take this apart. Or um, another one said like, well, uh, why don't you just build a new house and then you can put the, the airframe in the house and then you build the house around it. Well, I mean, I knew I'd be moving eventually and I was right. Here we are like eight years later and I'm moving. So I really wanted it to be modular. So I decided at that point to embark on this project to cut it into small enough pieces to fit through my basement door and then reassemble it in the basement. Um, I'm, I, I know of about three people total worldwide who have done this. Um, you know, flight schools, if they're gonna do this, they take the whole thing and they put it in a, in a big building somewhere. They don't mess with cutting it up. So anyway, how did I do that? Well, first of all, I stripped out the interior down to bare metal. Um, to do that, I had to, I started from the back. I took the galley out. Uh, the galley was fairly easy. It's like a module and it just bolts to the floor with six bolts. And there's a bunch of electrical connections and plumbing and stuff. And then one big pin at the top that you pull and then the whole thing slides out. Lavatory is much more complicated. Um, it's you, you know, built into the airplane, if you will. Um, the back wall comes off first and then you take out the toilet and the sink and the mirror and then the forward wall and the door frame and all of that stuff. Um, they did, they were nice enough to completely service the lavatory before they sold this to me, so um, wasn't that bad, um, just took time. Um, and then I was down to you know, this point here, and, and this airframe came with its post 9-11 security door because they were already on to the next generation of post 9-11 security doors. This door weighs about 100 pounds. Um, I can't, I don't ever really say in public or online um, what I've learned about this door, except to say that it's really, really secure. So um, really cool design. Um, all right, so now I'm almost down to bare metal. You see that there's uh, you know, a bunch of pieces of the original trim that are still all around here. The circuit breaker wall, which I had coveted so much, is already down, lying on its back. And then here's a tray that the overhead panel goes in. And you see there's still just tubing and stuff all over the place. 
Um, so going back to the, the subject of dust that's inside the cockpit, I found this product at Home Depot super useful to loosen those, um, those old screws. PB trend penetrating catalyst, you basically spray the top of the screw with it and go away for 30 seconds or a minute or half an hour, and then you come back and it, you, you'll find the screws a lot easier to deal with. In spite of this, there were many that I had to either drill out or completely mangle by removing with vice grips. All right, so the next section, um, having the interior totally removed, was divide, divided into sections. And so I had to think at, at this point about, well, how is it going to come back together once I've divided it? So I came up with this system, um, which is made by my local metal fabricator, uh, where it was a, a set of paired brackets. And you see on the left side, um, this L bracket, this bolt, this is actually welded. That's a little tack weld that's right there. So it's welded to the left side bracket. And then there's an eccentric hole on the right side so that you have a way to, to kind of nudge things one way or the other as you're fitting them back together. And then they punched me some holes that were in the other uh, side of the bracket and allowed me to rivet onto the airframe. So every time I wanted to make a cut, I would draw the line where I was going to make the cut, and then I would come along and mount with temporary rivets. These are called clicos. Um, the, uh, these brackets, and then I would come back and actually make the cut and then go back later and rivet the brackets on. Um, and so you see the way this came apart. So I took the aft part of the, um, the roof, if you will, off of it, um, brought that down the side. This was with a system of pulleys up and now we're back in my hangar. Um, you know, even if I'd had a bunch of people to help me do this, which I didn't, um, this would have been really challenging to do because this was like 13 feet up in the air now, and I would have had to build scaffolding and everything around this in order to get this down. So I got down to this point, and then I got to this point. And so you see that the top is, is now missing. And so for a couple of reasons, I decided to bring the top off as one piece. The most important being it preserved the complex geometry of the top. Um, so that it would be easier to mount overhead panels later. But the other thing being there was less material to cut on each of these pillars as you came along. And so this is one of six major pieces that the, the cockpit now goes into. And this comes in through the basement door. It's only, it's about two feet wide. Um, it weighs about 150 pounds. Uh, two people can move it with a dolly. So this was one of the first pieces to come home. Uh, here's another cut here. This is forward of the FO side rudder pedal looking forward. So you can see I've cut a line right there. And then came along the bottom and cut along there. And so you can see now it's held up on the pulleys again and we're getting ready to basically peel off this side of the airframe. Um, these cuts here were really challenging to make because what Boeing does is they build a lot of structural strength into the airframe right here. And these ribs come really close together because they want to protect the pilots in case of, you know, like something that comes flying at the, at the cockpit. So there it is just about to come off. It's basically peeling away. And then you're left with this, did the same thing on the other side. And then there's just this one little center piece here that comes off. That's about 100 pounds. This is all made about out of aluminum, mind you but it's like, it's really thick aluminum. So that's how it winds up being so heavy. So my tools to use this, a, a four and a half inch angle grinder from Home Depot. Um, this thing called a reciprocating saw, which uh, you know, you'll also see called by its brand name with Milwaukee, a Sawzall. Very potentially hazardous tool um, because you gotta make really sure that you're holding it close to the work that you're doing. Um, but there were a lot of situations where I just couldn't do that. Um, so this thing would kick all the time. Um, another thing, just really gotta practice with it and be careful with it. This is a thing I found at Harbor Freight called a double cut saw. It's good for uh, quickly removing a lot of material because um, it, it's two blades that uh, counter rotate and, and they really chew, th chew through things pretty quickly. Um, actually fairly easy to control. So at any rate, now I had it in this stage we call the boat stage, kind of looks like a boat. You've got your flight control yokes and all your rudder mechanisms, pedestal and the throttle quadrant. And then I came and divided the floor into two basically by drilling out some rivets and cutting a line down the, uh, the middle. Um, and now is at the point where it's basically ready to take it home. So I took the, um, the pieces on the trailer over to my local equipment yard, which is close to my local airport, and rented the telehandler again. This time I didn't need the tutorial. Um, and took it and, and rearranged the pieces so that they were standing up on the, on the trailer. And then, um, long story short, I had to take it and, and put it in my driveway at that point. And here's where I got really lucky that I don't live in a community with a homeowners association because... <laughs> This eyesore was in my driveway for a good three months or so while I was trying to clean up the bottom of this and, and figure out what all this did and what I could preserve and what I could just cut and, and get rid of. 
Um, it was super dirty. Um, this is looking down the rudder wells. I did, I never took apart the rudder mechanisms. And the reason is the real Boeing stuff, it's got a, a crank on it so it, you can adjust for pilots of different heights. And um, it was just more trouble than it was worth to, um, to disassemble it. It cleaned up pretty well. Uh, but the other stuff all had to come off, especially anything that crossed the midline, because I'll show you, I'm gonna divide the floor in a minute. So here you've got the big crossover tube, pitch crossover tube that connects the two control yokes that are up there. There's the two control yokes. Here's some more crossover tubes um, that are there. Um, this is a typical thing where I take off the hardware and I just, I put it back in place of where it was gonna go back. So I went to grab it to reassemble. But the other thing I did, and these are hard to, hard to appreciate here, was I would write the date on the part. And then I take a picture with my phone. And so I've got this collection of thousands of pictures from the disassembly. And so if I ever wanted to look at that part of the disassembly process to know how to put it back together, I just look at the date and I go in my photo collection and find that date. And then I could come up with a picture again. Um, so here it is considerably cleaned up and I've already made a cut. You can see it goes right there and comes all the way down there. Um, and that allowed me to divide the floor in half. Um, East of these pieces is about 100 pounds. Um, you know, two strong people can carry it um, into the basement. Uh, not a real easy way to put that on a dolly. So then I came back into the basement, uh, mated the two um, sides of the floor back together. You can see a couple of my little brackets. There's one there and there's one there. Um, but it, it wound up needing more than that to keep it from towing out. And so I mounted some avionic shells. Um, I put the pitch crossover tube back in. Um, this connects uh, one of the brakes, that one connects the other brake, and that one connects the rudders. Um, the, um, the roll axis is done with aileron cables, which you can see there. Um, remounted my control yokes and used a level to get them uh, synced up. Um, Philippe did a very nice job talking about BFF simulation, Ian Hopper, and the dynamic force feedback section uh, uh, product that he does. Um, I could spend an hour talking about this, so I'm going to blaze through it and show you how I just did my pitch axis. Here's a 24-volt power supply. Here's that same uh, ING Pinney Italian MB082 motor. Um, and this one for the pitch axis is fitted with a 10 to 1 planetary gear head, which allows you to increase the torque with the same motor. Um, really, this should have been like a 100 to 1 gear head because the forces involved in the pitch axis are so strong. But then there's a pulley. This happens to be a tooth pulley because that's just what I happen to have lying around. Um, there's a control rod there, and then that control rod goes to uh, this little tab, which is on that big pitch crossover tube and moves the, the pitch crossover tube back and forth. Um, this is for the rudder axis. Um, these are off-the-shelf toothed pulleys and off-the-shelf tooth belt, and here's a tensioner. Um, and then the, the motor itself is behind here. Um, here's an example of how you read the position of a real flight control with some modifications. This is a, a brake, um, you know, just the toe brake for when the airplane's on the ground. So this, the green part's a Boeing part. It's had two holes drilled in it. There's one there and there's one there, okay? Um, the first one is a big one and that's for the spring. And what that does is allows it to develop static, um, you know, force on the brake as you're pressing down on it. Kind of like a, a real brake as you increase the amount of hydraulic power on it. Um, and then the other thing is reading the position. And we're doing this with a fidget uh, sliding potentiometer. It's basically a variable resistor. There's some wire there and it goes to a USB interface board. And then that can be read by flight simulator or your other software. And then I've modified the sliding potentiometer, drilled a small hole in it here. And this is a radio control airplane uh, rod that goes from there to the Boeing part. And that's just a piece of safety wire that holds it on the Boeing part. So as the Boeing brake moves back and forth, it moves this variable resistor and you can just read the position of it. All right, so I got everything done underneath the floor. I flipped it back so it was level again, built it up again. Um, there's a total of uh, six pieces that you see here. So two pieces of the floor, uh, the two sides, the front piece, and then the single piece that's on the top. And you can see it, there's my cabling for my visual system. Um, the top to the rest of it, I was able to index with real Boeing windows. So this is a real captain side P3 window. And you can see it's got about 50 fasteners around the side of it. So you just, you just line up to the top of the bottom and you start putting screws in and eventually it'll just reestablish the geometry of the top to the sides. Um, same thing on the other side. And then the P1 windows are structural. They weigh about 80 pounds a piece. And those also have about 50 points of contact. 
And when you get all these fasteners, it is, doesn't even take all of them, but you get them all back in and it indexes the whole thing. I had a small section of the, the floor that came out the back, basically to the level of the door. I decided that big piece of floor that I had before, there just wasn't enough room for it. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about avionics and how I did that. Um, so just to go over what's in your uh, typical Boeing 737 NG cockpit, there's 171 enunciators, 372 switches, and 65 rotary encoders, which is, you know, is just a, another name for a knob. Um, this is the general scheme of my setup. Uh, there's one big computer that runs the simulation. I'm using prepared right now. Um, ProSim 737, which if anyone's not familiar with this product, this is what allows you to fully emulate all the systems in a 737 on top of your base flight simulator. Um, there's a three projector system. There's edge, edge blending and warping software that works with that. Um, this is a hardwired gigabit ethernet that goes to these other two computers. Um, each computer runs a PFDND combo, one of the ICASs, and one FMS. So this one's called the captain, and that one's called the FO. Um, captain does the upper ICAS, FO does the lower ICAS, and that basically distributes the graphic load, you know, among these various computers. This is a pretty powerful computer. These don't really need to be. So, uh, you know, basically, you know, it doesn't need to be very high performance. So ProSim 737 is an absolutely fantastic product um, that allows you to take these various hardware interfaces and um, integrate them into your flight simulation setup. Uh, most of the ones that I used were by Fidgets. Um, this is called a Leo Bodner card, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Fidgets makes a number of different things for you know, uh, lighting enunciators, reading the position of switches, um, measuring rotary encoding. Um, that's a flight deck solutions one. Um, I'm almost out of time. I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is a real fire panel that I um, reverse engineered and got working. Um, this is a uh, dual seat uh, training device from Flight Deck uh, Solutions that I had to modify and completely disassemble to put into my um, cockpit. Uh, a lot of dry fitting back and forth. Um, this is how you do uh, monitors. This is a shelf that FDS makes with the monitor. Um, mounts. Uh, I challenge anyone to find a 15-inch monitor these days. Can't, can't go down to Best Buy and buy one of those. So eBay is your best source of those. A um, lot of dry fitting. I aligned my monitors before I put the bezels back on because it's easier to find the Windows menu up underneath there. Um, here, that process is basically complete. Um, the NG, the FMS lower ICAS bay, is about two inches wider than it is in the Classic. So I had to modify my classic pedestal. Um, there was about a half inch of play there with the pedals in their aftmost position for the shortest pilot. Um, this is just a little video showing there's, there's certain things where you really just want the OEM part. And the landing gear lever is a perfect example of that. It's got a big solenoid in it that locks you out um, until all the logical conditions are met. Um, there's nothing like it. Fire panel is another thing that I thought was really important to have a real one. Um, my throttle quadrants, the crown jewel of my sim, it's a real throttle quadrant that was converted by a guy named Art May, who's pretty close to here in Lake Wales. Um, he did all the wires for me, uh, fitted it with slip clutches. There's another hour lecture right here just about this component. Um, but you see that now that this is done, the auto throttles work as they do in real life. Um, you can take these with your hand and reposition them, and then the auto throttle will put them back where they're supposed to be, just like the way they do in the real airplane. Um, this is a overhead panel opened up by Flight Deck Solutions, uh, restored the trim, put that back in, uh, built that up going from forward to aft, uh, built a little um, wooden, it's a thing I call the museum on the back of it where I'm just able to put uh, some pictures of the construction and I have a little monitor that uh, you know, shows the, the flight display. Um, so this is the, just about the final video, um, you know, shows what it looks like before I started disassembling it about a year ago. Um, you know, you can see we've got uh, a room where you can have basically blackout conditions. Um, everything looks a lot better that way because uh, a lot of the voltages on this stuff is pretty light. Um, my visual system, I'm in the process of uh, upgrading as well while the simulator is down for renovation. Because um, there's, you know, this was sort of a rudimentary screen when the edge blending wasn't working that well. 
Um, but basically, I, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. Um, it was an enormous investment of time, money, resources, um, but I learned a ton of things along the way. I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this kind of project to go for it. There's a lot more resources out there online than there were before for doing something like this. Um, and a couple other pictures. And there, as promised, is the QR code. That's to my YouTube video. Um, this is my contact information. I'm a dot com, but I don't actually make any money from this. Um, that's my email. Please reach out to me if you're considering a project like this or even some little part of it and, and you have questions about it. Um, this is a party we have at my house. It's about 100 people in my backyard every year, and I actually have to hire uh, somebody to, to run the sim and somebody to, a second person to manage the line of people trying to get into the thing. It's so popular. So, all right, so thanks very much. Um, And as I said, we will be doing um, we will be doing questions after this with the remaining time, and then we'll be um, across the hall in the exhibit hall um, for anything that runs over. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Wayne Pikarski. He's going to um, talk to us about um, low cost and um, uh, compact integration, and uh, with a, a little more of a nod towards the software. So. Cool. Thank you. All right. Morning. So, um, yeah, my name's Wayne Pekarsky. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a bit more of the software side of how you build such a thing. So I'm actually a software developer, and I'm not, I, you know, I can do some electronics like my esteemed colleagues that we saw today, but um, I didn't really have the ability to chop up a 737 nose cone and bring it into my house. So I want to do something a bit simpler. So what we're going to do today is talk about, you know, how as a more of a software person, you could get started and build something more easily. So. I started back when I was a kid doing Flight Simulator 4 around 1989. I must have been like 11 or 12 years old. And that sort of gave me a passion for flight simulation, but also a passion for computer graphics and virtual reality and all these different kind of things as well. So around 2016, I sort of was sitting around. I was like, you know what? I think everything is at the point now where you could build a cheap home cockpit at home without having to spend tens of thousands of dollars buying all this exotic software and hardware and things like that. And I was like, you know, what could I do that's really cheap, small, compact, and put something together really quickly? I knew that immersion was going to be key to this, and I wanted to have wraparound screens. So I see a lot of demos where people have screens that are far away or just one monitor or something, but I really wanted something that was fully immersive that you could sit in um, and sort of do something like that and get it right. But the other thing at the same time is that I wanted haptics. I wanted the ability to reach out with my hands, touch things, move buttons. And virtual reality is not very good at doing haptics. So a lot of people are like, oh, I want to use virtual reality. But it's very hard to press buttons, flick switches, do things like that. So I sort of wanted the best of both worlds where I didn't want to have to build an entire airplane, but I wanted to do something quick and easy, but without doing virtual reality. So this is sort of a compromise and a, sort of a way of building something quick um, to get yourself started. So um, let's sort of start off by showing a quick photo. So this was at the end of 2016. I basically bought three 42-inch monitors threw them on some wire shelves and just wrapped them around. And I was also learning about how to use modern flight sims. I hadn't done flight sim for a while. As I said, I started on flight sim 4 and then I kind of got out of it for a while. So I tried X-Plane. Um, was X-Plane 11 was in its beta at the time and um, it had really good support for multi-screen, so I thought I'd give that a try. But I didn't really know much else. So I put it all together. So it's just three 42-inch screens. You can buy them really cheap. They were like $200 like three years ago. So it wasn't very expensive to put this together and um, mounted them on some wire shelves. I then cut out a few pieces of timber to mount the yoke and the throttles and things like that. So very quickly, you could sort of prototype something. Because I knew I wasn't going to be building a full airframe. <clears throat> and so I just wanted everything in roughly the right position. But trying to fit everything into that space, it's actually very sort of small and compact. You kind of had to make compromises on the placement of everything. And so wood was great for prototyping because you could just chop something up, move it, move it a little bit more. I didn't have to go to a machine shop to get anything done. I made everything at home. So that's a quick little layout. Um, you can see we've got a Cessna 172 running in this. And um, you sit in the middle. The whole dimensions of the whole setup, in this case, it's only five and a half feet wide and four and a quarter feet deep. So this actually sits in the corner of a small room. It actually doesn't use that much space. So it's actually very compact. And what you do is the view from this angle looks a bit strange because you're sitting outside of the cube for this photo. But when you're actually sitting inside of it, it's actually the immersion is perfect. So you program into X-Plane 
90 degree fields of view for three of the displays. And if you sit your head exactly in the middle, the horizon lines up, everything looks correct, and you're immersed into a cockpit. And we're using the video card to draw the cockpit rather than building a mechanical cockpit around you. So that works quite well. So some limitations. So the problem with playing X-Plane on a desktop machine is that you have to use a virtual cockpit. So you're using a mouse to pan around the cockpit and do things. I really wanted to avoid that. It seemed to ruin everything by panning the whole cockpit. It's designed to be immersive. We don't want to do that. So panning's terrible. Um, I also wanted haptics for real touch. So I wanted the ability to, when I was programming the FMS, I wanted to be able to press buttons on a touch, like a, a tablet or some keypad or something like that. So I didn't want to use the mouse to do things like that. It's very inefficient. And also, because I didn't have a huge amount of space, I didn't have the luxury of building out this huge cockpit. In a perfect world, I mean, I, I, I have never sat in a real airliner cockpit. But you know, from the talks that we heard earlier, I mean, you need like 13 feet of space wide to put an entire cockpit in your garage. I didn't have 13 feet, and the room itself is less than 13 feet. So you know, the space is an issue, and also I didn't really have the time. So I wanted to do a quick project. The plan was you know, uh, two weeks off from work. I wanted to sort of knock something out, get something going, and play with it, and not have to go down a five-year long rabbit hole. So that was kind of my angle on this. Uh, there's another limitation, actually, which is interesting in that you then have to pick the correct kind of aircraft to run within an X-Plane that supports what you want to do. Every single aircraft is made by someone different, and some of them do not support the capabilities that you want to do. So while you may wish to do this airliner, if that airplane that you've, like a commercial plane or whatever you've downloaded, if that doesn't support popping out panels or interfacing or external hardware, you can't make it work. So you have to actually pick something that's designed for this. And that was actually something I didn't realize. I thought I could make this work for any aircraft, but it turns out you have to study the aircraft very carefully before you pick it. And we'll talk a bit more about that afterwards. Also, you only get one viewpoint per PC in X-Plane. So X-Plane is designed so that you place the viewpoint somewhere, you can have multiple monitors, but they all have the same physical position in the environment. If you wish to have a camera that's mounted looking at one of the displays, the viewpoint is in a different location. You need a separate PC for that, and then you have to set up clustering, and then everything gets complicated. And we'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, the clustering in X-Plane is limited in that you can have multiple machines, but there's always one controlling machine that does all the work, and the rest of them just listen. You can't actually interact with those external PCs. And that was something that I learned when I was sort of studying how to build something like this, and that was a, a problem. So today I'm going to show you how I took the three monitors and I expanded it into something like this. So you can see I've got a variety of extra displays and tablets and all kinds of stuff there. I think I've got like four tablets and an external HDMI monitor and a few extra accessories. And this is all set up. So this is a generic cockpit in that it works with multiple different airplanes in X-Plane. So you don't have to commit to one specific airliner. So we're trying to use computer graphics to cheat and basically not build too many physical devices to make this easier. And so this here is the Zeebo 737. In a minute, we're going to show some more examples. But um, we're, so we've got the main three screens. We've got some Android tablets. And the key to this design is that I'm using Android tablets because you can get them really cheap. You can buy really old ones that are like five years old. You can get them for free or really cheap on eBay, or people are just throwing them away. So they're a really great building block that doesn't require you to have to have an expensive GPU talking to a monitor. They're self-contained computers that can do things and run software locally. And we'll show some software that runs on them in a minute. Uh, as a quick little aside, in the photo, you can see I've got some Cytec throttles and a yoke and things like that. I just bought all these things. These devices are so cheap that I was like, I really didn't want to build my own yoke and throttles. So you know, for like $100 or $200, you could buy a few bits and pieces. So I put that on there as well. And I also bought one of the GoFlight MCPs. That was, once again, I didn't really know too much. So I was just buying random things and piecing them together. And that's when I sort of discovered a lot of the integration issues with the software. So anyway, so that. Um, that kind of works. Um, the problem, though, is that there was a number of limitations that I ran into. And the first thing I ran into was like, well, I want to drag the nav display or the HSI or the ECAS display onto a separate monitor. And you can't do that. So in X-Plane, all of the aircraft, you can't just drag out a panel because the aircraft designers didn't put that feature in. And I was like, but I really want that. 
And then I was like, well, I guess I'm a software developer, so I guess now I'm going to go down the rabbit hole and work out how to do this somehow. So that's what I ended up doing, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today, is how we can use software to end up making this work. So as with all projects, um, you end up spending more time writing code or building hardware or chopping things, and you actually flying a plane. So this is my story. So um, let's go through some different aircraft that we can support with this configuration. So this here is the Flight Factor 767. So you can see that we've got the three panoramic screens. Um, but in all these different planes, the, the displays are in different locations. Sometimes they're not even visible within there. Like if you look, if you actually pan the cockpit down, there's radio panels and the CDU and stuff like that. Some of these things aren't even visible in the three monitors that I've got configured. So you really need the ability to somehow break those panels out and run them on display. So I'm showing this here in these screenshots. You can see that we have um, some, we have a monitor here that is showing some displays broken out on there. This is actually the Flight Factor FMS. This actually is what got me thinking about this initially, because I downloaded the Flight Factor plane, and then I was like, wow, they have a FMS that runs on a tablet using a web interface. And then that got me thinking, it was like, well, I should be using tablets to control this kind of thing. So I, I got ideas from looking at various aircraft and how they do different things, and that's what helped some, seed some of my ideas. Uh, but none of their displays pop out. So that was like a thing that really frustrated me. So then there's the SSG 747-8. This aircraft is actually interesting in a different way because you can actually pop out the nav display. I was like, wow, this is great. You can pop out the nav display. So I clicked on that. You could pop it out on the big monitors, but not on another one. But none of the other displays popped out. And I was like, ah, oh, close, but not close enough. And I was like, why is it that people don't pop out displays and planes? Part of it's the limitation in the X-Plane SDK from a couple years ago. Part of it is that now it's in the SDK, but no one does it. So that was a problem. So we'll show the solution to that in a minute. The other thing that's really cool about my setup for the SSG 747 is that I've actually got on the bottom here an Android tablet that's running the electronic flight bag. They have this tablet that controls the fuel loading, and it shows the clock, and it shows different information about the plane. And the way you use it is you pan the cockpit down to look at it, and then you click with the mouse. It's like, well, I don't want to do that. So I ended up building an app that runs on a tablet separately that controls the flight bag. So in this screenshot here, this is kind of one of my favorite ones, I've got five different displays from the plane broken out onto this touch screen, which is connected directly to the PC driving X-Plane. I've got an Android app running on this tablet here that's running the CDU. I've got the electronic flight bag. I've got two more displays running on an Android tablet. I've got my SciTech switch panels, and everything kind of works. So now we're going to talk about how to build such a thing. So how do we do that? Well, the deal with X-Plane is that it's based on this concept called a data ref. And so everything in X-Plane is stored in them. These are variables that are built into X-Plane that keep track of all the state. Where is the flap handle? Where is the speed brake? What is the current speed of the aircraft? And some of these are inputs, so that you'll request a certain flap setting. And then the, the simulation that's modeling the aircraft will move the flaps down. And then there's another data ref that shows you where the flaps are actually at right now, because it takes time for the flaps to extend. So you can both set the data ref of what the flaps you want it to be, and then you can listen to find out where they're at right now. And there's a whole bunch of other things. I've got some examples up here that show their values, so you can say, what's the tail number of the aircraft? And what is our current height above ground level? Um, what's the distance to the next waypoint? There's thousands of these data refs in X-Plane. Every single one of these you can listen, or you can read or write to, and you can learn things about what the aircraft is doing. And you can build external devices that control these things. So we saw from the previous speakers, there are lots of hardware kits you can buy that have knobs and dials. And fundamentally, what happens is when you turn the knob, you have to take the right or left turn of that knob and then send a data ref in X-Plane where you tweak it slightly in one direction or the other. And then the flight computer computes the next step, and then it affects the simulation. So data refs are really cool because it's a way of third party developers, people like me, to get in there and change stuff, export things to uh, other displays and devices, and it makes X-Plane more interoperable with different things. So this is sort of part of the key to how we do this. So the actual way X-Plane is built is that the actual scene graph itself is tightly tied to these data refs. So when you change a data ref, um, it, let's say there's a seatbelt sign position. 
Um, when you flick the seatbelt switch, when you click on it with the mouse, it sends a command into X-Plane. That command changes the data ref. And then in the scene graph itself, they encode in the fact that when the data ref changes from zero to one, the switch is gonna move from this angle to this angle, and then this to this. So it actually, X-Plane does a lot of the calculations for you. So as an aircraft designer, you just place the switches in positions, and then the data refs automatically change, and X-Plane does all the work for you. So it's kind of cool how they built it. The next thing you can do is you can access these data refs on a network. It's kind of complicated to write a plugin that bolts directly into X-Plane. A much easier approach is to run your stuff on a separate machine and talk to X-Plane via a network protocol. There's this fantastic plugin called EXT Plane that's been written by someone named Villa Ranke. So he's a developer who wrote this plugin for himself many years ago, and it's published on GitHub, so there's a github.com link there to X-Plane. But it's a GPLv3 open source plugin. You run it in X-Plane, and me and a lot of other developers use this. And it's a great way of getting access to the data refs because you can send commands via a network socket saying, I would like this data ref. And then whenever it changes, it sends you a message back on your network socket saying, this data ref just changed. And that's great as a developer of something who's going to run on a tablet because then you don't have to worry about writing a plugin. And lots of people use this, so that's one less thing you need to do. And X-Plane actually has an API internally for doing data refs of sorts. It's based on UDP packets. It doesn't work very well. I spent a couple of weeks in the woods kind of trying to understand how it worked. It wasn't really good at doing lots of data refs. It wasn't good at doing text strings, which we'll show the reasons for that later. But um, I would definitely recommend the EXT Plane plugin. So um, definitely check that out. So the first thing I did was like, I really want a CDU so that I can program the FMS on a plane. And I wanted something that was generic so that it would work on many different aircraft. So around 2018 at the start, there was nothing for X-Plane at all. There was the web-based FMS in Flight Factor aircraft, and that was it. And I was like, well, what about the Zebo? What about the SSG? Um, I wanted to control them as well. And so I was poking around in the aircraft, and I discovered that there are all these data refs for the CDU itself. So if you look here, there are a bunch of different strings that they've defined where they have line 0, 1, underscore G, I, L, M, S, and X. And every single line on the FMS has um, the string for it, and it has all the different colors. So if you want to write the word hello in green on line 1, you set line 0, 1, underscore G to hello, and then it will appear on the FMS. And if you want to write it in magenta, you set this one. And every single line, there's like eight lines, and there's a small line and a big line. Every single one of them is encoded as a text string. So then all I had to do was read all these data refs out of X-Plane whenever you're running the Zebo or the SSG planes. And then you can piece together the contents of the screen of the CDU. So then I wrote an Android app. I'm a software developer who does Android stuff. So um, I built an Android app. I take these data refs in. I assemble them on the screen. And then for every single button on the keypad here, X-Plane has commands that are defined. And if you go around in the aircraft object file, you can see those commands in there. And so the A key has a key underscore A command. You put that in your app. You send those commands into the EXT Plane plugin. It sends them into X-Plane. It changes the, um, the data refs. And then it comes back out to the terminal. So it's a very easy way of poking commands in and then pulling the strings out. So, that's a CDU app, so I published that on the Google Play Store for Android, and that's open source as well. So I've released all the source code for it. It's on github.com slash Wayne Pekarsky explain CDU. We'll have all the links to this at the end of the talk if you're interested. Um, so this was my first foray into sort of breaking things out of X-Plane and getting them running on separate devices. So that's kind of nice. So the next thing, I was like, I really want to break out the displays from the aircraft. And it seemed to be impossible. So in January of 2018, when I was looking at this, there was no way to do it. As I said, the SSG had the ability to pop only the nav display out and nothing else, but I wanted everything. And I was like, surely this can be done. And so I was poking around for a while trying to work out how to do this. And it was sort of interesting because I was studying how the aircraft were built, and they all seemed to render to this panel texture that if you poke around in the instrument maker and in the plane maker tools for X-Plane, you could sort of see some of these pieces being assembled. And I was like, I want to get that out of the plane somehow. How can I do that? And the way these 3D cockpits are built in X-Plane is they're great in virtual reality. You wear the headset, you look around. They also work great if you're panning around with the mouse. But as I said earlier, I didn't want to pan with the mouse. I wanted it full time 
preferably running on a separate computer completely, but I was willing to accept it popped up on a separate display. So I was like, what could I possibly do here to make this work? So this is a screenshot of my plugin running that pops up Windows out of XPlane. So it's called X Texture Extractor. It's also open source, and I published this around January of 2018 as well. So let's talk a little bit about how this works, um, because it was quite challenging to sort of understand how this works. So if you actually poke around in, in if you go to Xplane, there's in the developer tools menu, there is a texture browsing tool. And you can actually see every single texture that's been loaded into the GPU. So you can see things like the aircraft liveries, you can see the ground textures, the skies, everything else. What I also found was this entire texture here, which if you look at it closely, it's every single display in the whole plane pasted out into a huge texture atlas. And this is how all games and simulations are written. They generate a huge texture, they put it in the GPU, and then later on the simulator draws this texture in various places. And so X-Plane has a process where every aircraft writes its panel texture out, and then they hand that texture off to X-Plane, and X-Plane then renders it in different places. It then does the shadows on the cockpit, then it renders the cockpit around it, and then it renders the rest of the simulation, and then you see it on your screen. So I poked around and I was like, if I can work out how to find the ID number of this texture, then I have the ability to draw it myself. So I wrote this plugin that, it turns out this texture is always the same size, and it's usually different than any other texture in the memory of the GPU. So I go through the memory, hunting down textures, trying to find something that looks like a panel. And when I find it, I then capture the ID for it. Then in X-Plane, it's really easy to create new windows, and then you say, draw texture ID number 3052 into this window, and voila, you have textures popping up, just like this here. And the interesting part about the way this works is it's actually almost free. So a lot of people talk about frame rate drops. When you pop one of these windows up on top of the existing X-Plane, it has almost no frame rate overhead whatsoever because the texture is already in the GPU, and all I'm doing is saying, hey, X-Plane, you, you just drew like 40 million triangles. Can you draw like one more for me? And it has that in it, and the X-Plane's like, all right, whatever, and it just draws it. So it's really cheap that it doesn't care. So drawing triangles and polygons is really easy in OpenGL. So anyway, I wrote this plugin, pops the window open, draws the polygon, sets the texture ID, and voila, it works. And you can do stuff like this. And so what we can do with X-Texture Extractor is we, I had a spare, my video card has four outputs on it. I was using three for the screens. I had a fourth one with this touch monitor attached to it. So you can see here I've got, four, uh, I've got uh, two different windows popped out here, but you can just simply undock them and drag them over to this external monitor. When you, when you draw with X-Plane to a new monitor, you actually do pay a frame rate hit for it because it then has to do another whole frame buffer. But that cost is what you would pay whether you put X-Plane on there or my stuff anyway. So it's really neat because you can drag a whole window over there and then you can use a touch screen and you can actually play with the resizing and move it around and whatever. So that's X-Texture Extractor and it's all open source as well. It's on my GitHub thing. And the really neat thing about it is that it works with every single aircraft in X-Plane that has digital panels. And so it doesn't work with steam gauges. Steam gauges are actually weird because they're actually rendered by rotating a needle around and there's no texture generated at any point. I can't grab those out, but any aircraft. So Flat Factor, SSG, Zeebo, um, you know, all the different little GA aircraft, any of them that have a digital display of any kind, all of those textures are undockable with my plugin and you can put them on separate monitors. And then the other cool thing is that rather than just doing native X-Plane windows, I've actually done this other feature where you can actually go into the GPU and rip the texture out completely and then transmit it over a network. So we actually have the ability to create a stream of compressed PNGs and send them over the network and send them to remote PCs as well. So you can have Raspberry Pis, you can have uh, Android tablets, you can have other Windows or Linux or OS X machines, and any of them can read this texture stream and display them in separate windows. And I've had a few people reach out to me who are building home cockpits. I actually just added last week the ability to hard code in the positions of windows. So you can write a script that basically creates windows in different places and you can tightly dock them to your frames for your um, aircraft panels or whatever you're making. So yes, yeah, so we have the ability to transmit these textures over a network to any local machine. So, um, and that basically allows me to build this configuration that I showed earlier, where you can see we have textures broken out on all these different panels here, and it runs really cheaply, and you don't need to contact the aircraft manufacturer to get them to add this feature. So it works with everything, 
and there's an Android app and you can sort of pick and choose whatever you want to do depending on what kind of devices you have and so forth. So that was um, one thing. Quick little aside project, what I really want is an overhead panel. And I haven't built this, this is a prototype, but the Laminar people actually have this thing called xptools.git, which is this repository they built of code that can load in an X-plane aircraft. And I was like, well, this is interesting. So I loaded it up. It actually turns out it has the full scene graph implementation that can load an entire cockpit in. And this is my, I, I, I took their code and I modified it. And what's really cool is it has the ability to highlight all the switches. You see all the switches are in red. And um, oh, wait a minute, where's the other picture? Oops. Hmm, that's weird. I thought I had this in here. Okay. Um, so every switch is in red. You can actually hover the mouse over each button, and it shows you the data ref and the command for each one. I've noticed a lot of people, when they're trying to build overhead panels, they sit there and explain in the data ref editor for hours, trying to discover which one is changing whenever they press a button or whatever. It's actually possible to go into the 3D model and extract this information out directly. I'm in the process of writing a plugin for X-Plane that will hopefully, you just hover the mouse over a point and it'll tell you which data ref is gonna trip off or whatever. I'm, this is a work in progress. You have to follow me to keep up to date if I manage to get this working. But this is a prototype I built and what I wanted to do was take this whole app, put it on an Android tablet and just mount it above my flight sim so I could press buttons. But I didn't wanna have to rebuild an entire cockpit and get every data ref and command manually. I wanted the ability just to do this automatically in software somehow and not have to rewrite the entire aircraft again. There are actually a number of other aircraft, there, there are a number of tools you can get uh, right now for building home cockpits. There's XHSI, ZHSI, uh, there's Air Manager and a few things like that. Every time one of those apps wants to build a nav display or an HSI, they actually have to rewrite all the code for the aircraft again. And if you switch aircraft, they have to rewrite it again. And it seems like a lot of work to have to maintain all this separate code over and over and over again for every single aircraft, and then as the aircraft evolves, you can't keep up to date, and then the project falls out of sync and it gets too complicated. So I really am a big fan of trying to automate this. The aircraft has all this stuff encoded into it. I don't want to have to do it again. So this is a little thing I'm thinking about, but um, so I have a wish list for X-Plane of things that I want. So what I really would like is sort of more standardized data refs for building um, home cockpits and things for aircraft designers to use because every aircraft I've noticed does everything differently. Like on the EFIS panel, you've got the range of the aircraft. Every single aircraft, flight factor from laminar from so forth, they all have different data refs for that one knob. And it's like, you end up having to do a lot of extra work for every single plane, so it's kind of annoying. Uh, it'd be nice if they had support for sort of bulk data ref synchronization. The EXT plane protocol is not super efficient. Um, it would also be nice if X-Plane had the ability to do proper synchronized shared cockpits and things like that, because then it would allow you to do some of these things that I want to do here. Um, and I've, I've been talking to Ben also from Laminar yesterday about ways of doing the texture extraction more efficiently. Currently, when you take the texture and transmit it over the network, there's actually a cost to go into the GPU and pull it out. You do what's called a GPU pipeline stall, which actually lowers the frame rate of your video card. I've talked to him about a way of possibly cheating in the video card and pulling it out in a way that doesn't cause a stall. So um, I'm going to see if we can do that. Um, and it would also be nice because a lot of plugin authors, like I, I run x on Windows, so I only make plugins for Windows. But I have a lot of people who contact me saying, I really would like a plugin for the Mac, and I can't build it and test it because I don't have that set up. So I really wish Lam and I would provide some better templates that support some of these things. So that's my little wish list. OK. so. To quickly finish up my talk, what I want to do is, so I did, so I'm going to sort of wind back and sort of talk about how I got into flight sim initially. So I started in 1989 or 1990 roughly, and I had a little 286, and I played flight sim 4. So many of you have probably seen this, and so this is flight sim 4 at Meigs Field. So um, I love this stuff, and I was like, wow, this is the future of computers. This is actually what got me into computer graphics, and I ended up doing a PhD in augmented reality and all these different things. So. I got into this area and it was all inspired from Flight Sim 4. And so I have the boxes at home. Um, my parents and my grandparents asked me, you know, like, what would you like for your computer? And I was like, I really want Flight Simulator. So they got me this. And it was like, this is what started the whole thing. So here's a picture of my computer that I used to run. And I knew from the 14 inch monitor, I was like trying to fly Flight Sim on this thing. And I'm like, the airport's over there, but I'm looking through this tiny 14 inch window and like, I can't see what I'm doing. And I was like, I, I knew that you needed side monitors. And so that's what got me thinking from my current setup about side monitors are the key. And so unfortunately, 
Back in those days, there was no time, sorry, there was no um, decent hardware that was cheap enough that you could do something like this. And so I, I knew that side monitors were the key. So, um, so I thought about this, and I was like, well, I want to run Flight Sim 4 on my current home cockpit. So that's my screens. It's the same setup as I showed before. But I wanted to run Flight Sim 4 on this setup. So you can run Flight Sim 4 in an emulator. Now, you can run it in an emulator. It only runs on one screen, though, because you've got to remember back in the day, um, the computers of the day were typically like a 286 with a mega of RAM. It had a VGA card that had only one output. Like two outputs were like a huge deal like 10 years later. So you only had one output. So then the question is, is how did I get Flight Sim 4 running on three screens like this? This should not be possible. So anyway, let's, um, I'm going to show you what, how this works, and then I'll explain what I did to make it work. So this is Flight Sim 4 running on three screens, fully synchronized across them. I'm running three instances of Flight Sim 4, and they're all talking to each other to keep them in sync. So there's a, the middle one is the one that's in control, and I'm flying it with my SciTech controls. And then what we're doing is we're synchronizing the data to the other two machines to keep them all in sync. But you've got to remember, back in the day, there was no Ethernet. That Flight Sim 4 didn't even support serial ports for clustering or anything like that. So this was impossible. So um, anyway, so you can fly around Meigs Field with side monitors. And finally, I was able to live the dream of what I've always wanted to do as a kid. And it actually works really well. Like, you'd be amazed, at, even though you don't have textures, you don't have anything, um, it actually is really nice and flyable. And you can look out the right window and see the airport and get nicely lined up. And it's like a perfect way to fly a Cessna around Meigs Field. So this is what I always wanted to do. It took me 20 years to build this thing. But I, I was so proud of myself that I finally finished it. So how do we build this? So the cool thing is, is you go poking around in the memory of the virtual. Uh, so you run Flight Sim 4 in a DOS box. And the cool thing is, is back in the day, every Flight Sim or game or whatever ran in a megabyte of memory. So there's only a meg of memory that you have to look at and study and work out what you want to do. So I poked around in there. And it turns out that um, if you play with Flight Sim, the coordinates are actually limited. Every coordinate is always less than 65535. So we know, therefore, that it's a 16-bit number. So we know kind of what we're looking for. So then what we do is you run Flight Sim, you take a memory snapshot, you then move the plane, you take another snapshot, then you diff them together. And there was like 100 places where the memory had changed. So I sat there with the virtual machine, and I just wrote zeros over those locations, and then Flight Sim would blow up and do weird stuff, and the plane would follow. And then one time, I hit zero, and the plane shifted. I was like, aha, got you. So that was the location where, that stores the location of where the plane is. So then we worked that out, and we didn't have much time to go through it here. but. Um, um, this is the dump of the memory locations, OXD, uh, sorry, OX28D0 and 18 bytes onwards, where all of the coordinates for the plane, uh, for the orientation and position, are stored in Flight Sim. So then what you do is you simply grab those 18 bytes from the middle machine and copy them over the network to the other two machines, and you inject them into the memory, and then you can push all the two external monitors around, and everything's in sync. And then this is like a, I filmed an internal view of the plane. So anyway, that's my Flight Sim 4 hack. And actually, in the Hoover app for the conference, I've posted a picture of this. Uh, if you could all upload it for me, it would be kind of fun. Um, so I'm almost at the top, so I'm hoping we can win with this and let everyone else see it. So anyway, that's my little hack that I did in my home cockpit. Um, so I just want to finish up. So um, all my stuff that I make is open source. And that's different than free. There's a lot of stuff for X-Plane that people are like, oh, I've made this app, and it's free. However, the person disappears and then X-Plane changes, and then that plugin is dead because it doesn't work anymore. And there's a difference between free stuff that someone can, just gives you but they keep control of, and then there's open source, which is where people give away the source code for it. All the stuff I do is GPL or BSD licensed so that I can give it to other people. And it means you can do what you want with it. You can change it. But also, I'm trying to build a community here because I've made my texture extractor. People send me, plug people send me changes to it. They're like, hey, I've got this new aircraft. Here's a config file for it. We all share these things. We all benefit from it. So it's really important that um, if you're going to give stuff away for free, just open source it. If you're going to sell it, well, then you can't do that. But that's always a good idea. And the other thing is that I've noticed a lot of projects do this thing where they use Google Drive, and they have patches and zip files and all this junk, and you've got to piece it together. What I really would like is for people to use Git repositories where you put stuff in with proper version control. And so I have all my stuff hosted on GitHub. There's the link to it there. And GitHub's really cool because it shows you the history of how the plugin has changed. So this is the texture extractor. You can see how, over time, you can see the dates when I've made changes. And then you can also see a list of the 
the actual changes I made. This is really good for, as a programmer, to understand what other programmers are doing and getting ideas and then sharing them and sort of helping to bootstrap this ecosystem. So anyway, that's my talk. Um, thanks for coming. So my website is xplane.waynepie.net. If you go there, it has a web page that summarizes all my plugins and apps and where to get links to the code and everything like that. I want to do a shout out to Villa Ranke, who is the author of EXT Plane, which was really awesome. And also I want to thank my parents and my grandparents because they're the ones who you know, bought me that Flight Sim 4 back when I was a little kid. And I've noticed at the conference here, there's kids running around and it's really cool to see that these you know, people want to learn. And so if anyone's got any questions, you know, feel free to come ask me. I'm always happy to help people. I'm on Twitter there if anyone's got any questions as well. Otherwise, we're going to have Q&A now and then we'll be outside to answer any questions. Thanks very much and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Everyone's going to come up? All right. All right. Well, thanks very much, Wayne. Um, that was fantastic. I hope you all have enjoyed this panel. Um, we did leave uh, you know, about uh, 15 minutes for questions here in the room. And then if we run out of time, we're going to gonna go across the way there, and you know, we'll continue the conversation. Um, so we're open to your questions. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, can you resize the texture? Actually, you can. So OpenGL can resize the texture for free. So basically, it applies a transformation matrix to it. You can actually warp it, rotate it, scale it at zero cost. So my plugin doesn't do it, but it's actually something that's very doable. The beauty of graphics cards is that they have this pipeline that's designed to do all these transformations for, for free, basically. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next question? And uh, that? Yeah. I actually talked to Ben. So the question was, how will the plugin be affected by a transition to Vulkan? Actually, I've spoken to him. Um, there is a slight tweak in the way the plugins are done that I'll be able to change, and it should be supportable. And he actually gave me some hints as to how to get the ID better in a way that will be less problematic with Vulkan, and it may be faster as well. So I've got to work on that. So it should be possible, and I don't envisage that it will break. But I have seen cases though where other plugins are doing weird shaders where they are being broken by Vulkan because they're rewriting the shader architecture. The beauty of the way OpenGL works is that there's tons of plugins. Ben mentioned yesterday that they need to preserve OpenGL functionality for those things. So you can write on that. Um, so I, I'm actually in the process of just completely ditching the visual system I have, and I'll, I'll be looking at a new one. Um, they're Optima 5T5 ST projectors. I believe they're 1080p. Um, there's uh, some wedge, or, uh, some um, edge blending and warping software that's called Immersive View um, that basically puts a grid up there and allows you to adjust the grid and, and the overlap. And then the screen itself, um, was made by uh, Art May at Northern Flight Sim, and it's a it's a three piece curved projection screen. But I, I want to switch to something that's uh, full height, if you will, and, and is a single piece. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, another question. <laughs> good, good, Philippe. I would say uh, at least like three hours a day. So a long four years, five years, six right. years, 10 years, <laughs> as long as it goes. <laughs> if you can make three hours a day, you can get to a good point within two, three years. Uh, less than that, it's going longer and longer. It's pretty much that. It depends what you want to do. Yes. Right. Yeah. What's, what's the scope of your project? Yes. Uh, yeah. so. I, mean, so, I mean, I'm a software person. I'm listening to you guys talking about cutting up plane cockpits, and I'm just like, whoa. Like, I, I'm very impressed. Okay, well, this is... well, see, I'm thinking the same thing when it, you're like delving into you know, like these bits and stuff. I'm like, software is easy, well though. beyond. And literally, like the texture extractor, if you look at the code for it, it's literally 10 lines of code that does the important stuff. Yeah, the yeah. trick is working out those 10 lines, but it's actually pretty quick if you know where to look. Yeah. But cutting a plane apart, that just takes time. Well, and, and I'll say um, it, a lot of it is the scope, right? Um, I run into a lot of people that say, I just want to fly. I don't want to spend five years building. I actually want to fly this thing. And so if you were to go to a company like Flight Deck Solutions and say, hey, just send me an entire 777, let me plug it in, uh, then you're looking at probably a couple months. But if you're trying to do your own fabrication, your own designs, um, and those kind of things, 
you're, you're looking at, like, like you said, a couple hours a day for probably a couple of years. But I have found that I have found significantly more joy from building than I have from flying. Yeah. So I always say if I accidentally finish, <laughs> I'll start over. <laughs> You end up going down a rabbit hole. Like I went down the rabbit hole of the, tra the texture extractor and the CDU and all this stuff, and I learned all this stuff about aircraft. I actually barely fly. I have people email me going, wait, how do I do blah, blah, blah on a plane? I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Can you show me a picture of what button it is? Because I actually don't know how to fly a plane. I, I, I barely fly. <laughs> I flew my simulator once last year <laughs> when some friends came over and I said to my wife, hey, honey, do you mind if I take them to fly the sim? So I, I literally, um, I tend to fly when guests come over. The rest of the time, I'm largely focused on, on building or tearing it down and rebuilding. Maybe I'll answer that quickly. I don't still have a sim PC. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like a small PC running there, so I just made like, Quick flights, testing the yoke, testing the rudder, but I've never flown that yet. <laughs> I should be done that by the end of the year. So. How about you, Wayne? Uh, it's like a, uh, you know, it's a number that's probably less than 1%, but we're going to round it up to 1%. Uh, I barely fly it, yeah. I mean, most of the time, it's just mucking around with stuff or learning things. And uh, there's more, it's, it's funny, because I'm a software developer, so everything becomes a software problem at some point. So it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. You're looking to solve strange problems, and it's a problem that I, I got frustrated with initially. And I was like, ah, oh, I really want this panel popped out. And it's like, and then you, that happens, you know. But if you want to get started quickly, I really like my approach, because literally I did it in a day. I, I, I had a day off from work, and it was just before the holidays. And I'm like, you know what? I went to Best Buy, bought two televisions. I had one already, I had the computer. I just slapped them up on some shelves, put it together, and put a joystick in the middle, and just started trying it. And then you go from there. It's like a way to try to see what you want to do. Because you don't know what you want to do. Actually, that's one thing I'm impressed with is that right from the day one, you're like, I want to build a triple seven. And you pick the hardest plane you can get <laughs> that you can't buy parts for. That like, you know, you, you really set the bar very high. And I'd, I'd say ironically, um, I thought it would be easier because all the MFDs are digital, ah. but that it, it, it was pretty, pretty rough. All right, so do you regret your choice? If you had a time machine, would you say, oh man, you should have built the 727? Like, no, did you... not at all. Okay. And in fact, because I see so few 777s, I, I found it to become a relatively unique project. Okay. And most of the 777s that I see, unfortunately, have to use a lot of aftermarket parts because finding the real parts is difficult. So I have found so much joy in being a collector and being able to say, oh, I'm the only civilian with an MCDU from a 777 or an auto brake switch from the aircraft. So for me, that's become a, a big joy. Yeah. I, think, I mean, getting back to the original question, I think you know, the history of complex flight simulation building project is littered with people who started it and then abandoned it. Started it, didn't finish. And one thing that's been said over and over again is that you have something in flyable condition the entire time. So you can stop and, and fly it from time to time and kind of remember why you're doing this. <laughs> I, I'm super lucky because I can afford to have a real airplane and, you know, I put 75 to 100 hours on my real airplane in real life. And so I don't, you know, feel a need to fly my 737 all the time. Um, I do enjoy it, but yeah, it's, it's much more likely when somebody's over at the house and say, hey, and we'll even, I mean, we'll even have friends who say, can we come over just to fly the simulator and can you buy us pizza as well? It's like, yes, absolutely. Let's go do that. And that gives me a great deal of joy to share my enthusiasm with flight simulation with other people. A hey, question, Nate. Okay, so when someone says, I want to try a simulator, how long does it take from when you turn the power switch to someone can sit in it and fly it? A minute. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Because so, oh, no, mine is turn the computer on, then you're like, oh, why is the MCP not working? And then you're stuck around this. Oh, and then, oh, oh, why is oh the you mean if everything working? works the first time? No, no, so. usually, <laughs> no but usually it doesn't. So it's kind of right, like, right. This, I, I usually am like, you know what, I need 30 minutes to like, fire everything up and then, what do you mean the sound's not working? And then you do it and then you get to restart x and it takes like five minutes and then it's like there's this thing that happens. So I'd, I'd say half an hour is a good safe amount of time to have. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of like the old joke about the Airbus, you know, like uh, the, the FO goes, well, why is it doing that? And then the captain goes, uh, why is it doing that again? You know, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Question.
<laughs> I don't have space. Uh, <laughs> Who didn't want to do that? <laughs> I, I'll say this. Um, when people come over to, to, to fly my simulator, and they're standing behind and they're watching, I will literally see them doing this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's weird you're, you're, when it's an immersive visual display like Peter's uh, your mind makes you move so I, I've seen some that do uh, you know six, six doff motion uh, displays and to me it doesn't add as much more immersion as one would think so I, I have no plans for motion yeah I'm happy to actually cut corners on things I said I want a fully touch based overhead panel I don't really care about the switch I just want to do it so it's kind of like, it, there's a lot of compromises you can make that's just as good, that's, you know, okay? Yeah, I would say for, the, for my project, an example, the, the force feedback plus a, uh, a bath shaker, mm -hmm. that would let, adds a lot. Because feeling the vibration of the plane on your body and your hands, that gives you a lot. Sometimes if you don't have like visual reference outside, your mind won't recognize the movement. Uh, that's what I felt like in a few uh, DOFs um, platforms that I've, I've tried. And uh, you, your body, if you close your eyes, you won't know what is happening. So it's all, all in here. So if you have good points there that, uh, that gives you, uh, triggers the sensation, I can tell you it's uh, 80, 85, 90% of what you need there, I'm sure. And you're not really supposed to fly upside down either. And that's, that's a, I mean, that's an off-quoted statistic as well, that the, the motion and even the full level D type sims is really just the last 10% of the reality. And I'll echo what Robert said, that I've had people get airsick in my fixed base cockpit, because if the visuals are so good. And the other thing is it's, it's enclosed, yes. And, and yes, you're getting the vibration from that dynamic force feedback. I mean, he was talking about a, a base um, shaker, right, or it's sometimes called a butt kicker, you know, that you can just mount underneath the seat and will give you a lot of the vibration that you get in real cockpit. And all of these are just, they're sensual, or, um, sensory cues to the actual flight experience. And so, you, you know, you really don't need the motion. And if you were to, to add it to a cockpit like mine, you're looking at a whole different building and hundreds of thousands of dollars, even like to buy it used from somebody. And it, there is a, a project, somebody was telling me about it. Somebody's building their own six degrees of freedom, you know, thing for an airliner cockpit and they've engineered the entire thing, but. And it gets really dangerous too. Oh, yeah. like it's safe if you've just got a static platform. Once you've got hydraulics, I mean, if, if something fires wrong, like if your software does something wrong, potentially you could throw people out or hurt mm. someone. Yeah. And it, it's risky to start putting crazy hydraulics that can pick up. I mean, how heavy is your nose cone? No, it's probably about 2,000 pounds. All right, so I mean, you gotta have hydraulics that can throw 2,000 pounds around? Mm. That's and, serious. And can power. do the heave, which is one of the yeah. motions, right? So you get into turbulence and you need to have it drop like suddenly yeah. like three feet. And so it's gotta be able to catch 2,000 pounds yeah. after it drops yeah. three feet. So you've gotta like have a lot of confidence in that equipment. So personally, I don't no, I really have any desire <laughs> to do that. So. What other questions? I got a Sir. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for the game that you guys have done. It's amazing. And, uh, and I feel kind of, you know, happy with what I feel. And my wife and friends think I'm crazy. And I took a picture of you guys, and they were just like, me. <laughs> <laughs> Day as well, right? I, I mean, thanks for that. I mean, I have guy friends that I tell, like, listen, if your wife's giving you a hard time about whatever your man cave is in the basement, just bring her over to my house for about 10 minutes. And she'll, she'll feel a lot better. Don't worry, Sam. So. <laughs> all right, so it's about five after. Um, we need to get the room over to the next group. So thank you all very much, and we'll continue we the conversation you. outside. Thank you. So. Thank you.